I'm back in plenary session. This is the virtual edition. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Zeb Yamrozik. Dr. Yamrozik is a practicing physician. He is an expert in infectious disease ethics, and he is joining us from Melbourne, Australia. Zeb, it's great to see you again. I think this is the seventh time we've spoken. Yeah, it's great to chat again. So you're in Melbourne. Yeah, that's right. We're coming into winter here and uh, the sort of pandemic madness is nearly over outside of hospitals, at least. Hmm. Well, it's not over here. So that's what I wanted to pick up with you on. Number one, uh, although many U.S. hospitals are dropping the mask mandates, some hospitals continue, including some of the hospitals that I have to work in, which means that all the visitors, all the doctors have to wear the mask. And when you walk the streets of San Francisco, one in 20 people are wearing a mask outside to this day outside. So. What are your thoughts on this? Let's maybe let's start with the healthcare workers first. Healthcare worker masking. Do we have good data? Look, I, I don't think we have good uh, randomized control data. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of what, a lot of what we have um, is from uh, influenza and the and the SARS outbreak, and it's often kind of observational data where um, they bring in a set of policy changes that includes masks and uh, infection rates among staff go down and it's inferred that masks are quite good at protecting staff um as we've talked about previously on this show uh you know i, I think one one question one important question that hasn't been tested is that i think it might be the case that masks are more effective when you use them only in high risk situations for short periods of time because then you can for example wear a very well fit n95 for just five minutes while you see an infected patient uh, then you leave the room and take it off and it might be that just having that in place as a policy for high risk situations might be as effective or similarly effective or non inferior to a mass mask policy. Because certainly when I walk around hospitals and I see people in the N95s, less than one in 20 of them has it well fitted to their face. And we know that if that's the case, it's no better than a surgical mask. And if it's no better than a surgical mask, it might be no better than nothing uh, for all we know. And so, you know, we should choose the policy that. Um, involves the least kind of uh, burdens, costs, and harms, including to communication, um, because it's clear that masks do prevent us from communicating with patients, uh, while still achieving some benefits. And um, mass continuous, um, universal, endless masking probably isn't that policy. How many randomized trials should we have done on something like healthcare masking? <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it seems like the, it seems like almost one of the ideal situations for a randomized control trial. Uh, you have a um, well-identified population and intervention. Uh, there are highly compliant population who are likely to follow the kind of rules of the trial. Um, it's a it's a closely monitored environment um, where you can measure outcomes. You won't get a lot of loss to follow up. Um, so it seems like we could do we could have done a lot of um, trials of healthcare worker masking of different different masking policies, different masks at different times, and so on. Um, and it's remarkable how few policies there's been. And you know, now, now as, as I've pointed out online, you know, we have technologies like phylogenetics where we can measure um, the relatedness of the virus. And so we could measure how much virus is spreading from patients to staff, staff to patients, visitors to patients, and so on. And that would help us understand uh, not only do the interventions reduce cases overall, but where is the transmission being reduced? Um, so there would be some great uh, research designs we could do, and it's remarkable how few we've done. Some of the proponents of masking have said recently, these are the people who are most ardent proponents of it in March and April 2020, that they never opposed randomized trials. Uh, how do you square that with advocacy? So, I mean, in general, you know, it's a broader question. You're, you're both an advocate. We ought to do X. And you don't actively say, and we also ought to test it. You, you omit that. They never said that. Uh, then later they say they never opposed testing. At the, at the same time, their rhetoric sabotaged any equipoise to test. Maybe that'll get us an equipoise. Yeah, that's right. So there, there's this um, uh, very tight interrelationship between uh, research and research ethics and health policy and health <laughs> policy ethics. And one way of um, understanding that is talking about equipoise. And as as you know, the director of the CDC was recently asked, why weren't more mask studies done during the pandemic in the United States? Yes. And she said, well, I just didn't think there was equipoise. And so I think it's it's worth talking about um, what equipoise means for the ethical justification of research and policy, because uh, it's relevant not just to pandemic policy, but to science policy, medical policy in general. And you have to go quite a way back, right? So the idea of equipoise started out with this idea of the individual clinician 
uh, would the individual clinician be willing to enroll uh, his or her patient in a research study? Yes. And the idea is that, and the idea is that if there was equipoise or uncertainty between the intervention and the alternative, and the alternative might be nothing, if we weren't sure which one of them would be better for that patient, uh, then it would be ethical for that clinician to enroll their patient in research rather than to choose what they knew to be the superior policy. Um, that's the idea of individual equipoise. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's lots of problems with that because mm -hmm. um, we can't necessarily trust individual clinicians to be all over the relevant data and so on. So a, a more um, kind of updated version of equipoise is the idea of uh, community equipoise or collective equipoise. Mm -hmm. And that is the balance of opinions among a relevant community of experts about um, is the intervention better than the alternative? And so, for example, you might imagine, um, in fact, at the start of the pandemic, uh, there was no equipoise about masking because most experts agreed uh, that it didn't work. They're like mass community masking didn't work. Um, and maybe some people thought that it might make a little bit of difference. So maybe you might think there was, there was a little bit of equipoise. Um, but but the basic, the, this kind of simplistic version of this is that suppose that all the relevant experts, scientists agree that we're not sure if the intervention is better um, than doing nothing or doing the alternative. If everyone is uncertain, then that's a clear case of equipoise. Mm -hmm. The idea is that when we get some really high quality new data, uh, many of those experts will change their minds. Equipoise will, equipoise will be disturbed. And if the new data shows that the intervention is really good and many people start to believe that, um, then we lose equipoise. And two things are supposed to happen then. One uh, is that uh, the, the policy should be implemented for the relevant population because it's kind of like, you know, most people think that it's going to be a benefit and so it's ethically justified. But the second thing is that it's no longer ethically acceptable to do research on the policy in question in the population in question because you would be exposing some research participants uh, to a you know, less effective intervention or nothing when we knew that something works. The standard of care has changed for future studies. That's right. Yeah, the right. standard of care has changed. Now, of course, there's you know there's, there's small kind of considerations there, um, because we we might still do a similar trial, but in a different population uh, where the, where we don't know about the standard of care. Um, it might sometimes be acceptable to continue the research trial to gather some more longer term data, provided that the risk is small and so on. Um, but, uh, the idea is that, yeah, the standard of care has changed, and so we're not supposed to use the, the inferior intervention, or we're not supposed to do nothing if something works. So it becomes a problem when people are proclaiming very loudly that, um, say, an intervention like masks or cloth masks is highly effective, um, because if it is the case uh, that most experts agree that it's highly effective, then, then based on the kind of standard equipoise argument, uh, we shouldn't do research trials on Mars. So it makes research trials um, not only unnecessary, uh, but unethical. Um, and, and so that, that's a problem. And it's a problem when, when a lot of people change their views based on very weak data and experts agree that something works, the, the research becomes unethical in their view. And then we never we can never find out. So there, there has been some great work done on this kind of problem recently um, by kind of giants in this field, like uh, Alex John London at, at Carnegie Mellon. And um, he pointed out, for example, that often it's not the case that experts agree that there's uncertainty, so that everyone is on the same page. We don't know if the intervention works, and so research is ethical. What often happens is there's disagreement. Some experts think that the inter intervention works. Some experts aren't sure, and some experts are sure that it doesn't work or that it's, or that it's a net harm. And so um, it might still be the case if there's a significant minority of experts um, who think that it's either uncertain or a net harm, even if the majority think that it's beneficial, say masking, it's still ethical to do research provided you've got a you know big enough cohort of experts who think actually the data aren't good enough. And I think that's the, that's the nuance that was lost um, when everyone was saying, uh, or when many people were saying, uh, we must do something in this intervention, we're sure that it works. That's a really nice summary. And you took us through, you know, Friedman and everything on equipoise over the last quarter or, ha or now half century. Um, that's a very nice summary. And I think listeners would benefit from hearing that. Back to the Rochelle Walensky point, um, she, I think, specifically was asked in the context of kids. And one thing that undermines her claim that she, that there was no equipoise is that WHO and CDC disagreed. The mere fact they disagreed tells you there had to have been equipoise between two to five. They don't agree. Um, so I think that's one. Two, we did run some randomized studies. We ran Bangladesh, Dan Mask, and the ongoing or pre-printed Guinea-Bissau study. That tells you that at least some people disagreed enough 
that they ran the study. So that undermines her claim of no equipoise. And then just to bring it back to the point, um, I think, you know, there's a tension that in order to get people to change the policy in six weeks, they had to not just say masks work or masks might work a little bit. They had to scream masks are the answer. And they did. They had memes. They screamed it from the rooftops. And so it did undermine equipoise. I mean, I don't know. They can't have their cake and eat it too. The reason you you got the policy change was that you downplayed uncertainty, which actually made it harder to study. And so you are part of the problem. I mean, if, if the pro in my case, the problem is lack of evidence. You were part of the problem. You were just on one extreme side. Um, you know, thoughts on those two points? Well, yeah, I think um, I think the right message in early 2020 was uh, masks and some other interventions might work. And we're going to try and work out, or we're going to try and determine through scientific studies how well they do work. And while we are determining that, we want as many people as possible, you know, outside of the trials to use them just in case they do to try and get this first wave of infection under control. That would have been fine as a public health message. It would have allowed us to implement policy rapidly and also do research. And once you had the results of research, you could say to people, well, it turns out that this works and this doesn't work. And so we're changing policy and there would be a justification for changing policy. Um, but on your other point, what it what it raises is, well, who's the relevant community of experts for equipoise judgments? Um, and what kind of information is supposed to disrupt equipoise? So on the question of um, who's the relevant community, uh, it probably it should be the global community of experts, because one thing we've seen in the last few years is that in individual countries, um, there's so much kind of uh, peer pressure, maybe even group think um, in one particular country that yeah. the, the experts in that country become convinced of something. But if you just look overseas or, you know, to, to other places, to the World Health Organization, if different agencies have different policies, that suggests there probably is equipoise. There's uncertainty about what the right thing to do is. And that's the perfect moment to do science. That's the that's the moment where science is most, most ethically justified. And on what should be allowed to change our views, um, well, it should be new high quality data. I mean, that, that you know, new high quality science can change people, people's views. But what we've seen is that political pressure um, can change can change people's views, um, kind of fear uh, can change people's views, and that can affect experts as well. Um, and so when we're making judgments about um, about what experts' views are on an intervention, we should ask for why they think what they do. And if they can point to high quality data, that's much more reliable um, than perhaps other justifications. Recently, Tom Jefferson and Cochrane performed a meta-analysis of the randomized controlled trials of physical interventions to slow and eliminate the spread of respiratory viruses. Included in that was one plot on masking, community masking. Um, it was negative for the primary endpoint of uh, laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 and, and influenza. The confidence interval went from 0.72 to 1.4. Um, in response to that, uh, Jefferson was quoted as saying, uh, simply put, colon, something like, there's simply no evidence masks work, end quote. The point estimate is close to one. The confidence interval is 0.7 to 1.4-ish wide. Uh, the editor-in-chief of Cochrane issued an unprecedented rebuke. Um, it's quoted in the New York Times as saying that uh, that was an incorrect interpretation. The better interpretation is that the results are inconclusive. Uh, we haven't yet published this, but we're going to put it on the preprint server any day now. We went through every Cochrane review where the confidence interval was just like that, you know, broad. Okay, and we pulled all the statements from the, the final manuscript and every single one of them says this don't work. They don't say it's inconclusive and compatible with point estimates that might still work. They say this don't work. You know, basically what Jefferson said, uh, his Cochrane review is in line with all of the others. So what is unprecedented was her rebuke. Um, thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it sounds very problematic, doesn't it? Um, and yeah, I think that the whole reason why we do uh, meta research and meta analysis, and try and combine research trials, is that some trials can give us a false signal that that something that something does work. But as we gather more data, um, look at more populations, and try and uh, pool relevant data together, uh, we find that um, the overall signal um, can be null. And 
that that's really quite strong evidence. Even if within within that set of trials, some of them suggested there was um, efficacy. Uh, once we pool very large numbers, uh, it might turn out that those signals for an effect were probably false, and the overall effect is null. Um, and it's it's appropriate to say then um, that we have evidence that they don't work. You know that the intervention doesn't work, or this type of intervention in this population uh, doesn't work. Um, and it's remarkable uh, how much political pressure has been put onto this topic, um, including affecting people like um, that person at Cochrane. Uh, and um, it, 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 at some point, at some point, people people are gonna people are gonna have to abandon this idea that masks were highly effective, right? So. Um, what is it? History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. I mean, the same thing happened in the 1918 flu pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, people panicked. Uh, they, a lot of people recommended masks. A lot of people claimed that they were being highly effective. And then five, 10 years after the 1918 flu pandemic, everyone agreed that they probably didn't do anything. And the same thing is going to happen now, a mm hundred -hmm. years later. Um, so it's remarkable that we haven't, we, you know, we, we think we've come so far, but sometimes we're doing the same thing we used to do. As a thought experiment, if we find out tomorrow that there's a new respiratory virus and there's an outbreak in, uh, let's say, Kenya or Iran, and uh, there's confirmed human-to-human -human transmission. The WHO says the initial estimate of case fatality rate is 3.8%-ish, uh, 3.8%, <laughs> and there's a, a log gradient with every decile of age, something like that, a lot like COVID, but it's a new virus. What do you think, just as a thought experiment, what do you think would happen? Would Australia reinstitute border closure, lockdown, masking? Will the U.S. reinstitute our policy? What, what, what do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm genuinely curious. The, the, it combines the evidence with the, the, the politics, the sociology. How would it play out? Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really hard to know. Um, interventions like border closures, for example, uh, were always kind of... Um, uh, not endorsed by the World Health Organization, who want, who want people to be able to continue to move, um, and they saw that border closures might have um, uh, unforeseen consequences, and those consequences would affect the, affect the worst off the most. And that's true of many uh, kind of unprecedented policies. Um, but border closures were immensely popular, um, especially in isolated countries um, like Australia. And unfortunately, you know, I think there would be a lot of political pressure to do those again. Um, I hope that we've learned um, that some other things that we did during COVID would not be likely to be effective in the next pandemic. So for example, uh, outdoor interventions of all kinds, uh, you know, for respiratory viruses. Um, I, you know, I think, um, I, ho I hope that mask mandates, especially outdoor mask mandates uh, <clears throat> would, wouldn't go into, in, but I think they might be, might be popular again. Um, but I do think that um, very stringent mass population interventions like lockdowns, I think there's starting to be increasing consensus that the harms of those, um, especially the harms to, say, children and the worst off, um, were maybe unacceptable. Um, and I think, I hope that there would be more pushback um, against those kinds of interventions next time. But, we, but we've set a very ugly precedent in this pandemic, and we've set the precedent um, in many countries that... Uh, not only will we Im implement these very stringent um, policies, but we'll have police enforce them. Uh, you know, we'll close public parks, we'll fine people, we'll punish people, uh, rather than uh, trying to uh, invoke community solidarity, try and get people to work together and um, do things that might actually work or like avoid truly high risk settings like crowded in indoor areas, uh, which might make a similar, because a, a lot of the things we did just did not work. And, and, it's remarkable if you look at any graph of multiple countries, um, you can look at whatever outcome you want. You can look at COVID um, deaths, you can look at all cause mortality, uh, you can look at multiple countries, or you can look at multiple states of the United and, States. And add Sweden to the plot, because Sweden is doing well. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course Sweden's doing well, um, <laughs> because, I mean, we talk about that in a minute, but mm -hmm. what's what's more remarkable, I think, is that uh, it's it's so uh, they're all con they're all basically convergent. Yeah, the same place. Everyone adopted, yeah, everyone adopted different policies, um, and there wasn't a very big difference in outcome, uh, especially in kind of poor cause mortality. And where there was a difference in outcome, it wasn't related to kind of COVID deaths. You know, places like I don't know the United States and the United Kingdom, they've got a lot of non-COVID mortality. So that tells me that um, 
many of the policies we chose didn't really make a big difference because there was all this argument about this country's doing better, this country's doing better, but a pandemic is a long game. The virus is going to circulate for years, decades. Um, and in the long term, it really doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, so it's hard to see um, how it would be justified to choose one option over another apart from targeted interventions for high-risk settings and high-risk individuals. In the U.S., I think what would happen is um, the, all of the liberal places would reinstitute all of the same policies. All of the conservative places would go even further the other way and do nothing. I think you would have a huge migration of people, uh, including me, because I'll be on the first, uh, I'll be packing up my apartment and moving to Texas. Uh, I'm happy to keep my job, I'll just zoom it in, um, but I wouldn't live here. And I think if anyone tried to force the red states to um, abide by these restrictions or lockdown, uh, I think there would be civil war. I mean, I think that would be the prep, it would push us into war. Um, so those are, just, I mean, I think that's just how it would shake out. Uh, the liberal places have learned nothing. They will still close their schools. They, I don't think they've learned. Uh, the conservative places, I think we're probably closer to being ac correct, actually. They didn't protect the vulnerable. That's their failure. But they were correct because they didn't curtail freedom as much. Um, you know, I, to be honest, I always hated the conservatives, obviously, because I was a liberal, you know. But uh, on COVID, I give them credit that, you know, I'm kind of glad that they do that they were around because, and maybe I'm kind of glad that there are two parties. You know, I used to think maybe there is something valuable to different parties and uh, maybe more than two would be better, but it gives us like laboratories of experiment. Um, and, you know, in times of crisis, you'll get some diversity of thought. Um, let me ask you this. You said, I saw a thread where someone argued, um, that focus protection, what the GBD authors put forth, is not was never tenable. But you talked about targeted interventions on the vulnerable. You think it was? It, it obvious. I mean, my question is: Was it tenable? Could it have been done, and let let children be free, let young people go to college, and really focus on the old? Or did the population mix too much? Or could it have been done? Uh, yeah. So the, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of things there. I mean, first thing, I agree with you. If they try and do this stuff again, I'm on the first plane to Sweden. Right? I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 out, I'm out of here. I'm leaving. I'm leaving uh, this country if they try and close the borders and lock down again. Um, but and then uh, on the point about uh, the different the different populations um, and the different views, I agree. We, you know, there's there's a good reason why we want to have pluralism in democracy. We want to have people with different views. Um, and even if you don't like the conservatives. Uh, or other things, the kind of insistence on liberty on and on there being a very high threshold before we curtail people's liberty. Sometimes, obviously, that goes too far. Um, but sometimes when public health or government are trying to curtail liberty without good justification, uh, it forces, you know, um, or it forces people to justify what they're doing. And if they can't justify it, well, then it doesn't go through, at least in some places. Um, on the progressive side, I mean, I think there's there's a sympathetic reading of kind of progressives in the United States and elsewhere, um, which is that, you know, they can, they can see society is unfair. They could see that the virus was going to affect many of the worst off in society, the, the worst, you know, especially obese, uh, poor people who don't have healthcare access in the United States. And they want everyone to be protected. You know, they're motivated by this kind of um, noble, noble goal. Um, but unfortunately, where that took them was focusing on these symbolic acts um, so wearing wearing masks, um, you know, doing things that aren't actually that effective. And it distracted from a different progressive goal, which might be uh, social change, you know, getting more people access to health care, getting more people sick leave, um, uh, getting more social resources diverted to um, people who are worse off. And I, I think it's a real problem in the United States that um, focusing on the virus uh, throughout the pandemic was was a way of not talking about the bigger social problems that are actually causing a lot of this COVID mortality. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's obvious that among the Democrats, they wanted to exaggerate the risk of the virus because the guy they didn't like who was in charge of the Re Republicans was saying it's not that dangerous. And so they needed to make him look really bad. And so the, the, the fear mongering about the virus went up a lot. Um, but on the, on the last question about uh, focus protection, so I, I think there's I think we need I think we need to we need to um, keep in mind there's the aspect of time, and one piece of good news in this in this pandemic is that we got vaccines that were effective for high risk individuals, and we got them in a very short space of time. And it, there's good reason to think that we'd probably for for another novel virus we'd probably get them in an even shorter period of time right. for the next flu. Correct. Bad pandemic. 
And so the good news about that is you only need to shield or shelter uh, the high risk people for maybe six or 12 months until they get access to vaccines. And I think that is feasible. You know, where, where, where critics of uh, focus protection are correct is that we can't shield people forever. You know, um, highly dependent people need to interact with other people, even if they're carers and so on. And eventually they're going to get infected, just like everyone's going to get, in, get, in, get infected. Um, but it is true that we probably could reduce their risk significantly for six or 12 months until they get vaccinated. Um, and everyone else... Um, there's just, yeah, there's no reason why we should be restricting the freedoms of low risk individuals um, because it, it's causing harm. We, we've seen the incredible harm it caused among young people um, and it's not causing a lot of benefit at the population level. You know, that's really excellent points. Let's go back to the progressive question. I think it's so interesting. I mean, I think there are two hypotheses. The, the favorable hypothesis is what you've offered. They had their heart in the right place. They were thinking about vulnerable people. They just were distracted by totems, by masking and Fauci bobblehead dolls and, you know, stay six feet away from me. And they didn't do paid sick leave. They didn't do universal paid sick leave. They didn't do health care for all. What a great opportunity to say, you know what, this pandemic reminds us that no matter how poor you are, even if you're moved to this country, even if you, you know, you just came here undocumented, we need to provide health care for you. That's what a decent society would do. Um, if you feel get sick on the job, we should give you some pay so you don't feel the pressure to come in when you're coughing. They didn't do those two things. They did masking. They did distancing. Here's what else I notice. Um, they were happy to keep the Uber Eats going. They didn't do all their cooking at home. There was no slogan that said, hashtag cook your own meals. It spares someone from bringing you the food. There was no... Um, uh, you know, hashtag, actually, we can just close the slaughterhouses. We'll just eat, you know, vegetarian because slaughterhouse is a high-risk occupation. There's no hashtag, let's close the kitchen. That's where people are getting sick. Um, so what am I to think? And also, I know a lot of progressives. Most people I am fr I'm friends with are progressives. Um, I guess I think there are very few people who actually are principled, like are progressives because they care about the downtrodden. And I think the reality is most people just care about themselves and their family. Um, they're selfish. I'm talking about not just progressives, everybody. They're just selfish. And, um, and, and, and that explains the policy better. Like a, a better explanation is they got scared. They wanted to keep their parents safe, their kids safe, themselves safe. That's it. You can all go to hell. I have money. You screw off. You wear the mask when you deliver my food at my door so I don't get sick. But I don't give a I don't give a shit. You know, if you get sick in the slaughterhouse, I need to eat chicken. I'm not eating lentils. You know. Um, so I guess to me, I do think it's a, I was I'm disillusioned. I mean, I don't think among all the people who are self described progressives, I don't think they actually believe in the philosophy, which is that we need to do more for those who have less. Yeah, um, that that's unfortunate if that's true because you know. Uh... What what else what else is it for progressive politics if it's not um, uh, improving the situation of the worst off? Um, you know, I think I think you're right that um, people do uh, people are to some degree selfish, and you know most most ethicists think it's reasonable to give some degree of priority to your nearest and dearest because that's that's the way normal human lives are. Um, but yeah, a problem when we do these mass population interventions like lockdown is that, as you point out, they don't protect. Uh, essential workers. They don't protect people in overcrowded housing. They don't protect people um, in prisons or people working in slaughterhouses and so on. And so what it actually amounted to was focused protection for rich people, right? So rich people, uh, we, and, and there's good evidence of this, we could decrease the infection rate among rich people who could shelter at home and have Uber Eats and work online. Correct. Uh, but and but insofar as we decrease the overall population transmission rate, which we probably did a little bit, um, it's all becomes concentrated in uh, these other people, poor people, um, essential workers and so on. And so it amounts to a different type of uh, focus protection. These people get to like avoid infection until the vaccines come. Uh, these people have to face a risk of infection. Um, and that doesn't sound like a very fair uh, intervention. In Santa Clara County in, Sa in California, um, there's a church that's facing like $6 million in fines uh, because they continued to hold events or not have masks and thwart the health authority. And one of the things they pointed out in their litigation was that churches were subject to more restrictions on gathering than museums in this county. 
At the same period of time, museums, you could run the museum and have more people there than the church. Um, and here's what, I mean, my cynical, I mean, what do I think happened? The people who set the policy are like me. We like museums. We don't really give a shit about churches. I mean, frankly, and that's the public health department. They're secular. And that translates into, but that's not good. I mean, what I want to say is that's not good because well, one principle of America is religious tolerance. That's why this whole country exists, is that we may not agree with whatever you're teaching in there, but you know, you're free to do it and we're free to do ours. But what you see is the public health establishment is secular. I think they discriminated against this church. Um, so I guess to, to, to feed into this, um, and I'll, I'll link it to this point. I think 20 states have passed bills that have, you know, um, cut the, the legs out of public health, that they just don't have any authority anymore. And I'm not sure that's a great idea, you know, for like what happens if somebody eats some bad egg salad, they're, uh, you know, they're, it's going to spread, you know. But, you know, I think they had it coming. I mean, when you tell when you tell people that you praying to God is not as important as me looking at a Monet, um, I think you've lost legitimacy in a, in, a, in a deep sense. And I wonder if you'd speak to what are your thoughts on this? And I say this as somebody, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested in church, but even I know they're getting screwed over. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. It, the, um, the justification for policy, you know, ethically speaking, has to be non-discriminatory. Uh, we have to be able to give good reasons, uh, good kind of public health reasons uh, for making the decisions that we do. And I guess the public health people would say, oh, there's been these super spreading uh, um, episodes in churches. People are singing in the choir and they're spreading the virus. And so we, we perceive these as very high risk um places, whereas maybe museums are lower risk. That's what, that's what they would say. But the reality is that um, any crowded indoor venue is going to be high risk for spreading um, the respiratory viruses. Um, and once we're, once once uh, public health agencies are making what appear to be arbitrary decisions between otherwise similar um, circumstances, then that certainly looks like discrimination, doesn't it? Um, and, you know, we had some examples of this in Australia, which were totally bizarre and based on kind of moralizing principles where they said, mm where they said uh, you could take off your mask to drink a coffee, but not to drink alcohol. Right? <laughs> really? And that, yeah. I, I, yeah. And I think that, that was also, that, that also came from the fact that many of the people in public health are very puritanical, right? Um, they, they see drinking alcohol as fundamentally kind of bad for various reasons. Um, and drinking coffee is kind of okay. And they, they would rationalize this by saying, oh, but if people drink alcohol, they'll become disinhibited and they'll be close to each other and they'll breathe and the risk will go up. But I mean, I think that's nonsense. Where, where it came from was kind of these judgments about the kinds of people who drink alcohol versus versus coffee. And that looks like un, unjust, unjust discrimination. And yeah, we shouldn't stand for that. Um, on that point about uh, cutting the legs off public health. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think they, they did have it coming because... When, when I think when I think about um, uh, being a say in, infectious diseases registrar many years ago, and when I think about what it took for us to call the police to say bring in this infected person, it had to be someone with say tuberculosis, you know, tuberculosis in the lungs, and it had to be really resistant tuberculosis where they really wouldn't do. We asked them, we tried to be nice to them, we tried to help them, we said please come in and take your drugs, and they wouldn't do it, and we try. And after we went through all these steps. Then and only then would we invoke the Public Health Act, call the police and like bring this person in. And it's supposed to be a last resort, the police power of public health. And when it becomes a first resort, well, then I understand that some people in society uh, think that um, these people don't understand when it's justified to intervene um, and when it's not. Uh, yeah, that's, that's such a great example. I also think about what it takes to commit somebody. I was on psychiatry rotations and we talk about it's not easy. It's very difficult and very strict. And why? I mean, the ethical principle is that when you intrude on someone's personal freedoms, you need a high bar. And the pandemic revealed we were able to say to millions of people en masse, no weddings, no funerals, and no coffees with friends. And that is an intrusion like we've never done. And the evidence just wasn't there. And we didn't generate the evidence. Also, it's very likely it didn't do anything. So it was just a loss of freedom without a countervailing benefit, which is really the worst kind of ethical crime. I mean, I don't know. Um, comment on that, or I have a, a question for you. Go on. Um, 
Well, no, just, just to say that, I mean, the, the other way of looking at it is uh, look what happened when we, in, in previous pandemics, right? So in 2009, the flu pandemic, there was kind of a significant overreaction, but didn't involve these kind of mass population interventions. Right. That was bad, but it wasn't so bad. 2017, there was a pandemic of influenza B, yes, uh, but it was never declared, right? So it wasn't declared a pandemic, but based on the other criteria for pandemic, that it's a, a new strain with uh, higher than usual levels of mortality spread to m multiple continents or whatever, there was a pandemic, it wasn't declared. And kind of, we, we kind of fumbled along okay. Um, and we need to do somewhere kind of in between, I think, <laughs> you know, with, with the next pandemic, we need to do something in between uh, just fumbling along and doing nothing, uh, but not going to extreme measures. I would love to see everything you do should be in the context of randomization as the one rule, because that will break them, because everything will declare futility very quickly, because I think pretty sure most things don't work. I mean, that's the reality. Okay, let me ask you this. David Zweig has a piece about a Montessori school in upstate New York. To this day, Zeb, to this day, they mask, they distance, and the children have to eat lunch in silence because speaking can spread the virus. One of the commenters wrote, this is child abuse. I didn't retweet it. But it made me wonder, is it child abuse? And then I want to say, for people who have been abused, and I've seen a lot of abuse over the years as a doctor, one does, it's not child abuse in the sense nobody's beating them with a belt or putting cigarettes out on their arm. That happens. It's not child abuse in terms of sexual abuse. But there are degrees of child abuse. Is it child abuse? Will it be child abuse in 2025? If there's a parent that still masks an 18 month old on a flight, I saw it recently. I think it's not, you know, so my question to you is a philosophical question. When are you so much an outlier from where everyone else is in protection and depriving children of, of the ability to speak when you eat at lunch, which is something that doctors never, I mean, I never lost that, my God. Um, and when does it cross into what we would consider abuse? that you're so far out of the hurt, you know, you're so far away from everyone else that we're gonna say, this is, you're really just abusing these kids because of your own neuroses. That's the question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? And um, it, it partly depends on social norms, as you say, like uh, when everyone's doing it, uh, then it's hard, it's hard to declare kind of outliers as being um, really unacceptable. Um, but also I think an unfortunate truth here is that I haven't read David's article yet, but at the Montessori school, I assume it's kind of upper middle class uh, families. Yes. It's rich people who um, choose to put their kids there. Yes, that, that's right. And um, uh, it's unfortunate in society that you imagine the counterfactual. So yes. ima imagine, imagine it's a, a poor uh, family, uh, you know, living in, I don't know, public housing um, and uh, they start for some other reason, uh, you know, requir requiring their child never to speak, um, put, covering their face. Uh, putting in all the putting in all these crazy rules, the child comes into hospital with say uh, mental health distress or manifesting as physical symptoms or whatever. Then pa pediatricians would say, uh, "Gosh, um, this seems like a behavior, maybe even neglect. So, you know, the child's getting speech delay and so on, um, and they would potentially call child protection on that person." That's a great um, point. Yeah. And, so and, if and, a rich and, if a rich person does it, we give him more leeway than a poor person. That's what you're saying. It's interesting. Yeah. I think I don't think we should give them all leeway, but I think it, it's just true. It's just the reality that we do. Um, and also, uh, you know, rich, rich people say, say the child, say those children at that school, and I'm sure some of them are going to become, if not already, mentally distressed by this experience. Yes, of course. Yeah. And it's going to come out in various ways. It's going to come out as anxiety, obsessive compulsive behaviors, um, physical symptoms in some cases, eating disorders. <laughs> you know, that's a classic situation which eating disorders arise in a very controlled eating environment. Um, the thing is that rich people are going to be able to keep those uh, children away from, say, hospital systems and like, you know, pediatricians who might eat, who might see this, see this, see this distress as a consequence of this action and then try and do intervention, whether or not that involves um, uh, child protection. Um, whereas, you know, if poor families do this, uh, you know, and luckily, most poor families have been <laughs> smart enough you know, not, not, to, not to do this kind of crazy stuff to their children. Their children continue to play with each other and like, they're probably a lot happier overall. But let's suppose that in my counterfactual that happened, um, it, they come to the attention of social services much faster and there's a much bigger judgment on their behavior when it's outside the norm than when it's these um, you know, rich people. And I think that's, that's not fair at all, um, but that, that's the way society often functions.
That's such an astute point. And um, I just want to point out that there is one place where it was the poor and minority kids who had to mask while the rich white kids didn't. And that's the New England Journal Massachusetts study. Actually, the child masking study that quote unquote proves that it works, that observational causal inference study. Um, the two schools that didn't were urban inner city Boston schools. They had to mask forever, the poor black kids, and then the rich white kids in the suburbs got to take it off. Let me um, ask you this. And I have an answer too, but are we making progress in science? Are we better than yeah. we were before? Good. So, so that's a great question. And to go to go back to go back to um, your previous point that um, a lot of these things don't work. Yeah, there's this, there's this idea of medical nihilism uh, that our priors about new medical interventions should be very pessimistic. The chance that we find something new and fantastic is very low. Yeah. And I think we should also. Have public health nihilism, right? Yes. The, the chance that a new intervention in public health is going to be highly effective, you know, as effective <laughs> as sanitation and so on is extremely low. Yes. Um, but in order to determine whether a new intervention is effective or how effective it is, we need to do high quality science. Um, and I'm, I'm a believer in science. I believe that in the long term, um, science is getting us closer to the truth. Uh, that scientific methods, especially like, um, you know, highly controlled methods are the best way um, of getting us to the truth. Um, and, you know, the overall goal of science is to reduce uncertainty, right, to create more certainty about does something work or not? What are the benefits and what are the harms? Um, so when people say there's too much uncertainty to do science, actually, that's totally upside down. We, we need to do more science. Um, but although science in the long term makes progress towards the truth, um, it often gets lost in blind alleys and dead ends. Um, it often gets influenced by um, political incentives, uh, by financial incentives, um, and by kind of very loud people in the scientific um, uh, community. Um, loud wrong people right. uh, can make can make more of a difference to uh, which questions get studied uh, which papers get published and so on than people who are maybe quiet and right or you know less less prominent in 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 the community um and we've seen this again and again in science um but what we've definitely seen in the last three years is science getting completely lost um and mainly mainly by political incentives um uh, and and by the type of people who do science and their political commitments and the kinds of questions they think it's acceptable to study, um, but also by financial incentives when it comes to, for example, pharmaceutical interventions in particular, um, where we're just not answering the questions that society really needs science to answer uh, in a good way. So I think in the long term, in the long term, we'll make progress, but um, with, a, with few exceptions, uh, public health science has kind of taken a backward step uh, in the last few years rather than a forward step. That's really accurate. Of all the ways in which science has failed, for me, the thing that's most concerning to me is the movement, particularly in the United States, in the left wing, to equate everything you disagree with as misinformation or disinformation. That is so dangerous. I see Bob Califf, the commissioner of the FDA, says, misinformation is the leading cause of death in America. A statistic that he's pulled directly from his asshole because there's no there's no actual i i pray that a journalist will ask the man where is your reference for that my friend that's missing from you just made that up man no one has asked him to this date they see it i saw cnbc just covered him again they no one will ask him be do your job journalist ask him where is that stat coming from he made it up man okay um but it's really dangerous because as we talked about before i think you put it well you i think you said i can hear your quote in my mind the things we thought were misinformation, vaccinated people can't spread, masks work 100%, boosters are necessary in adolescent young men. There's no such thing as myocarditis. There's no such thing as VIT, which we're going to come to. Um, uh, uh, many things that were part of the canon are misinformation, and I think it's really dangerous to try to silence your opponent by saying they're a purveyor of misinformation when the truth is nobody really knows some of these answers. We need to study them better. That's right. I mean, censorship is bad for science. You, you you want to be able to foster multiple competing views and then test them in a rigorous way. And the ones that fail the test, they're out. And then we like work with the, the, the smaller set. Um, and what's really troubling about this claim about misinformation is that a lot of what's been published in, say, the, the CDC journal, MMWR, uh, 
looks like classic kind of post-truth misinformation you know it's it's no better than um what what it's usually labeled as cons as um misinformation which is i don't know what conspiracy theorists believe or kind of i don't know ultra right wing people believe and so on uh there's a lot of misinformation uh in the center of politics there's a lot of misinformation on the left and unfortunately um you know uh science can be a method uh for getting closer to the truth um but science is also a social activity and it can become like anything. It can become a kind of uh, bludgeon to kind of hit mm -hmm. people with to say, uh, we've produced this science and so now you have to do what we say. Um, but if you take a more uh, indifferent, dispassionate view, uh, we should always be willing to question our assumptions. You know, the, the motto of the Royal Society of Science is take nobody's word for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and that includes the commissioner of the FDA. I saw recently, and you saw this article, I saw you tweeted it, um, in a pooled analysis of the randomized controlled trials of um, vaccine, women between the ages of 12 and 29 have an increase in death from AstraZeneca, cardiac death, not all death, cardiac death. And men have an increase, not statistically significant, but it's, it's, it was headed that direction of uh, cardiac death, you know, in the uh, 16 to 26 year old ballpark from mRNA. Very likely, we're talking myocarditis and uh, VIT, vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. My question is, was there a subgroup of people who were aggressively vaccinated in whom there was net harm, specifically women between the ages of 12 and 40 who may have already had COVID-19 or 12 and 30 already had COVID and then we gave them AstraZeneca anyway, men between the ages of 16 and 26 who already had COVID and we gave him three mRNA doses and as a requirement to go to school. Did public health harm some subgroups? Now, it's easy to, I mean, of course, I think it's, the listeners should know, they, the old people who didn't have COVID were benefit. That's easy, I think. And anyone who thinks otherwise is crazy. Put your tinfoil hat back on and go away. Okay, but, did, but it's important, even though you benefit a lot of groups, what, was there a subgroup that you think was harmed? Yeah, I think I think many people in public health uh, and in vaccinology are going to be uncomfortable with this idea. Uh, but the evidence is accumulating to suggest that there probably were situations where people uh, were exposed to a net harm as a result of vaccination. Um, and uh, it's I think it's clear to me that if you're a healthy woman aged 12 to 29, if it is true that your risk of death from AstraZeneca is one in 16,000, then that's likely higher. Well, yes. it is higher. Yes, it is higher than your risk of death from COVID if you've never had COVID before. And so it's uncomfortable to admit that. But we need to be doing, you know, precision epidemiology, precision vaccinology, identifying the situation where we're most likely to produce benefit and least likely to produce net harm. And that seems like a net harm. Um, and likewise, in the young men with myocarditis with mRNA, um, you know, I don't know what the what the risk is there. My intuition is it's in the order of kind of one in a hundred thousand or one in a million of of death from myocarditis. Sure, sure. Based, probably right. Based yeah. on populations like New Zealand who vaccinated everyone and have had X amount of cardiac deaths. Um, and so there would be there would be young young men, um, like you say, who've had COVID, yeah. um, who probably shouldn't have been back. Well, who definitely shouldn't have been vaccinated. They, they faced they, they faced the net harm. Uh, and I, I think the biggest tragedy, and I was actually, I was on this in 2021, emailing policymakers in Australia, was giving people the second dose of yes. mRNA, yes. young men. Yes. We knew we knew that the first dose, uh, that the, the main risk was with the second dose. We knew that the first dose would be highly protective on its own and probably protective enough for, say, young adult people. Um, and I think it's we, we knew enough to pause the second dose at that time or at the very least to make it non-mandatory because yes. the, re the real problem here is not that we um, put out an intervention, um, offered it to people, and then some people chose to use it and they, having chosen to use it based on what information was available, suffered a harm. The real tragedy is that we forced people to get vaccinated. And there will, there will be people who have died from vaccine-induced injury who would not necessarily have been vaccinated at that time and who might have waited, got COVID, and then after they got COVID, never got vaccinated and they would have been fine. And those people tragically and their families ha have been made worse off. I don't know if I don't know if the kind of public health 
authorities will get around to admitting that. But I, I think that's true based on based on what we know. Yeah, I think they're that's absolutely right. I think that most cohorts were benefit in aggregate, but the key cohorts that were likely harmed uh, in aggregate and with knowledge with with enough circumstantial evidence, you could have halted things were women in that target age group from adenoviral vector vaccines because it is a high DNA load that has a negative polarity that hits PF4 and then you get VIT and that's a death sentence. Often, not always, but sometimes and high, certainly more than myocarditis. And then I do think the men, particularly dose two, dose three, dose four uh, in, in men in that group, those requirements, net harm, especially for the people who had COVID, clearly net harm. Um, go ahead. I, I just want to emphasize one other thing, which is that, oh, people said, no, we need to vaccinate these these young people to protect others. Yes, that was but wrong. By, by April, May 2021, that was obviously not true. And one of the one of the things I hear that drives me crazy is people say, no, no, no. The vaccines were very good at blocking transmission before Omicron. It's this it's this uh, dastardly virus that mutated and it stopped the vaccines from blocking transmission. I don't think that's true. I mean, well, we don't have data on. Right. OK, yes. Yeah. So, so I mean, we do have data on um, uh, the whatever it was called, Alpha, the UK yes. variant, um, and Delta. There was already breakthrough infections with those, but there weren't as many. And it just so happens that two things happened over time. One thing that happened is that vaccine immunity waned. And another thing that happened is simultaneously the virus mutated. Yes. But not all of the vaccine escape, alleged escape, was due to the virus mutating. Most of it was actually due to the vaccine waning. And I'm sure if we did, for example, a challenge study with the alpha or ancestral strain of vaccinated people now, we could show that you can be infected because that's how coronavirus immunity works. You get short term duration protection against infection, longer term protection they, against severe disease. So it never they never block transmission. And again, getting getting public health agencies to admit that vaccines never provide a durable effect on transmission is going to be a long road. They may have blunted it a little bit. They never blocked it. And we did do a challenge trial. It was called Provincetown, Massachusetts. It was one hell of a party, supposedly. And, I, and, uh, and you know, that blew right through. But to your point, I think there's a second argument to make against the claim that we ought to have compelled vaccination in the youth um, prior to known escape, prior to Omicron. And the second argument is no one ever proved that you have an additional benefit. If you're an old, vulnerable person, you get the shot. How does me getting the shot, if I had COVID cough in your face, you still have the severe disease protection. So why are you forcing me? You already did what you needed to do for you. Did you prove that me forcing me has a benefit to you? You never proven that. So I think there's two arguments. One, we thought it had a very good severe disease benefit. Um, anyway, uh, point well taken. I think the point that, um, that uh, it was always on unsure grounds, the compulsion of the youth. Uh, that was a huge error. And I think it led people to blindly push vaccination in a few cohorts where there was net harm. Unfortunately, those were younger people where you really feel more guilt. Uh, it's not great to have a net harm on an 80 year old. It's really not great for an 18 year old girl. And if you happen to be the parent of somebody who's, you know, I, I don't know if you're the parent of a girl, she's 18 and she had brain herniation because she got AZ, I think, that public health failed you. And I think, Zeb, there are two failures. One, there's a failure in the moment. Public health still fails that family because they haven't admitted. They, it, it'll be 10 years before they admit that, you know, probably, yeah, we should have just said, let's take it easy on these kids for right now. Let's vaccinate the older people and let's watch for six months. I think, I think the fact we haven't yet admitted, it's a 10-year it's a, it's a thing. That's right. I and mean, I think first first we'll get the papers like the one you mentioned that yeah. give us a more accurate estimate of the risk of the vaccines. Mm -hmm. Then we'll then we'll get papers comparing the risk of the vaccines to yeah. the risk of the virus in those individuals under different under different um circumstances. And then we'll get the very uncomfortable, maybe um, admission that um people faced net risk uh that we and that we shouldn't have forced them to do it. But th there's there's a long term reckoning to be had there about about what policies are justified under what circumstances. Sometimes when you can see three steps ahead, it's actually not a blessing, Zeb. It's a curse because you see the way this is headed. Um, okay, let me ask you this. There was a study out from the Norwegians that took, uh, I believe, children between the ages of 12 and 25. They all presented with a PCR test uh, for COVID-19. Some of them had COVID-19. Some of them didn't have COVID-19. If you didn't have COVID-19, they tested antibodies and they excluded anyone who had had COVID-19. So this is a pristine group of people. We came in for a test, 
Some of us got it. Some of us don't got it. Then we followed them for six months in a sub-cohort, 385-85. Um, it was powered, pre-specified, to find a relative risk of the long COVID syndrome of 1.5. You're 1.5 times more likely to have long COVID if you had COVID than if you didn't. I would think you'd be 20 or 40 times more likely to have long COVID if you had COVID or if you didn't, because I didn't think you could get long COVID if you didn't have COVID. I thought it was a unique entity, but it was powered for 1.5, okay? They did the study, 47% of these kids in both arms have COVID, had long COVID. It was no different. They used another definition from WHO, no different. Um, critics were saying it's underpowered. And I was like, if you think this trial is underpowered, what's underpowered is your brain because it was powered for 1.5. You need to see relative risk of 20. Are you crazy? You think long COVID's hitting all these people without COVID? And what it really shows is there is this syndrome of brain fog, fatigue, feeling down. It just, and it's linked to loneliness in the paper. What it's not linked to is COVID, you know? And so what do you make of this, um, br you know, brilliant paper, JAMA Network Open? It's probably going to be one of the only con clean controlled studies because now everyone's got COVID. Um, what do you make of the paper and what do you think it means for long COVID? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, first of all, first of all, let's take the opposite extreme. Yes. So the people who are really, really fear-mongering about long COVID, including Harvard Medical School, yes. uh, you know, <laughs> can, can, can come out and say things like one in three people or one in five people who get COVID will get long COVID. Um, and, you know, there's kind of various definition problems or whatever. But if that were true, uh, we would be facing basically a zombie apocalypse of long <laughs> COVID, right? So the society would be full of people confined to their homes with brain fog, wandering around, debilitated. Um, you know, it would be it would be one of the biggest health crises we've ever seen. Um, but that has never eventuated. You know, whole populations have been exposed now. There is no long COVID zom zombie apocalypse. And you should be able to see that with your own with your own eyes, just like walking around the streets. Um, and so that tells you that in, in so far as there is something, it must be, you know, much less likely than, than is being claimed. Um, but now I, I, I think we've seen again and again in that study that you mentioned um, and in, uh, you know, the, some French studies and so on. Yes. That there, just, there is no relationship between getting the virus uh, and the symptoms of long COVID, at least the kind of brain fog, fatigue, post-infectious um, uh, syndrome. And you know, it's quite a lot. It's quite a lot like other post-viral fatigue syndromes, um, and the relationship between the actual exposure and the outcome isn't always uh, very reliable. And I think I think it was in that Norwegian study where, if you look in the supplementary appendix, they looked at some other things that were correlated with the, with the outcome. And you know, it's other kinds of uh, health behaviors, psychological events, and so on that make people more vulnerable to these symptoms. It's just not. It's. I'm sorry. It's. It's just not the virus that's causing this. Okay, last question for you. Mm. In the United States, in 2000, there was an accelerated approval for mifepristone, which is a synthetic steroid used, RU486 used in abortion. Uh, uh, in 2016, the FDA removed a bunch of restrictions, made it more easy to get. In 2021, they made it mail-order pharmacy. In 2019, they changed the REMS. You know, over the decades, it's kind of been expanded. Um, recently, a Texas judge issued a ruling where he said there's going to be a, like the FDA will be halted in, in, in being permitted to license, to authorize this medication um, because these plaintiffs have sued and said, you know, they think this violated the rules of accelerated approval in many ways. Okay. That's all going on. Um, this is not going to be about abortion question. Okay. Um, obviously in, in the liberal Academy here, you know, we're generally pro-choice uh, and that is kind of where I am too on that issue. Um, People have these long Twitter threads about, you know, how the judge is wrong and et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things I talked about on my pod, on my videos were like, you know, uh, I'm not a big agreement with the judge, but I think there is a societal question of who oversees the FDA. Is it the courts, Congress? Somebody's got to do it. Um, but that's not where I'm going. There's somebody who is a frequent commenter on COVID-19 policy who wrote a thread why the judge was wrong. In the thread, this person, who's going to be the Yale Dean of Public Health, said um, the FDA is willing to pull products from market when they have unfavorable safety signals. Proof of that success is Makena, which is uh, hydroxyprogesterone acetate, which was used for preterm labor. A huge failure. And if you look, if you look up Makena, 
you'll find 20 articles written about how the FDA has failed year over year to pull this drug. It left it on the market for years, maybe even a decade longer than it needed to be. It's like an example of the FDA totally failing at their one duty. Okay, McKenna. This person cites it as a success of FDA. A, 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 prof a professor at a East Coast University emailed me to say that what's really going on here is much bigger than abortion or COVID. It's that there is a huge incentive in academics to talk about things you don't really understand. Why did this person make this mistake about McKenna? McKenna is an example of the FDA failing, not succeeding. This person said it was a success because she doesn't really follow it. She doesn't know McKenna. She doesn't know the ins and outs. She doesn't know this. She hasn't followed this field. Of course, nobody can follow everything. But why is she also commenting on it? Because you get so much cultural cash from commenting on it. And in fact, the White House COVID czar, Ashish Jha, the only reason he's the czar is that he commented on a lot of stuff he doesn't understand. Okay, so my question to you is this. It's a deeper question. It's not about abortion. Actually, I'm not that, I mean, it's okay. You got, you all will fight it out. Okay, I'm not gonna solve that problem. Okay, it's about, is it the case that in academics right now, if you think back on the pandemic, all of the people who commented, um, often tribally, often reflexively, often fear-mongering, do they have perverse incentives for doing it, which is career, for their own career, is it good for them to ally themselves with a political party and then beat that drum? And if so, even when they don't know what they're talking about, and if so, one, how do we deter that or stop that? Two, you know, if you or I want to comment, how do we know we're doing it for the right reason and not for the secondary gain? Like, how, how do we soul search and ask, know that? So I guess, yeah, is it happening? How do we stop it from happening? And how do we know when we're supposed to comment? How do you think about it? Well, yeah, I think there's a difficult questions and you know for society and for individuals i think the broader the broader historical background right is that we are many people say that we're entering into a phase of the so-called attention economy or the reaction economy where what's become most valuable and you see this in silicon valley companies whatever is capturing people's attention and um, because that's where you can sell advertising dollars or whatever but the corollary as you kind of point out in academia is that um uh, saying things that are going to get attention for you, uh, whatever, get you followers online and so on, is good, for your, is good for your career. You do have a perverse incentive to do that. Um, so I think, uh, you know, ideally, you know, we want people to stick to what they really do know. <laughs> and uh, when they kind of stick their neck out and say something, talk about something they don't know, and then someone corrects them, well, then they should retract, uh, you know, what they said. The Harvard Medical School retracted their absurd claim about COVID. I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I thought about long COVID. Sorry. One in five, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was good. Um, and, uh, and yeah, ultimately we should be motivated by, say, say we're scientists, uh, we should be motivated by questions of uh, methodology and kind of generalizability um, and interpretation of results. And it's fine to offer your own interpretation, um, but... We, you should go into it uh, kind of indifferent about what you're going to find. And if you find something uh, that doesn't necessarily align with something else that you thought, you've got to try and, you know, raise that question for yourself. You know, why why doesn't this match up with what my priors were? And sometimes that's, you know, um, the piece of information is, is false, um, but sometimes it's true and it's trying to, lead, you know, lead you lead you towards, towards reality. Um, but the other thing is that the with this kind of um, the FDA and the institutions that we have authorizing pharmaceutical products, it's a complex system. Uh, it's a system uh, that is being gamed by large financial incentives um, and being distorted. Um, and people are in people at the FDA and so on. They're in a very difficult position when they get these harm signals and deciding about when to when to withdraw things and so on. I think it is very challenging. But we want our institutions to be as healthy and independent as possible, um, and not open to political influence. Um, but I think we're seeing evidence of decay of some of those institutions, uh, you know, in many democracies, perhaps in some more than others. That's really, really well put. Um, one of the things I think about as sort of a personal litmus test for myself is something that's a, a wise person once told me is that when you really practice evidence-based medicine, you eventually piss off your friends. In other words, um, if you really pursue the evidence doggedly, 
eventually you're going to piss off your friends. And on COVID-19, I pissed, quote unquote, pissed off my friends. All the people who are aligned with me on cancer drugs being, you know, poor trials and cost of drugs and all my Bernie Sanders friends, supporters, they were on the other side. But why? Because when you don't piss off your friends, you're probably succumbing to groupthink. Um, I think that's what happened here. Um, you know, and uh, similarly, I think they have a few wins. I mean, I, I, they're right about negotiating drug price on the left. They're right about universal health care on the left. I think so. I think the system before Obamacare was worse than Obamacare, although imperfect it is. Um, so, you know, so my friends on the right are getting pissed off too. Um, I think that's one litmus test. I think the other litmus test is um, to really, uh, when you approach an issue to not have strong feelings when you go into it. I mean, I don't care if I don't have, like I, I have some colleagues in oncology, they really love like ABVD or and they love some drug. I'm like, what do you care? It's just a drug. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it works, it works. You know, what do you, why do you have attachment to like some, they're like some drugs, not other drugs. I, I was like, you should have no attachment to anything you do. Be ready to throw it out if it proves that it doesn't work. Um, same with masks. I don't hate masks. I don't love them. But when I read the studies, I knew that you'd have to be dropped on your head to think that these work, which is not what Tom Jefferson said, but he should have. <laughs> he got censored for saying something much milder than that. But, you know, I did think that because the evidence is so bad. What are we talking about? Um, okay, so that's one of my litmus tests. Do you have any that you use to make sure you're sane? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think, say, in um, in clinical practice as well as in public health, the, yeah. the, the the question you should always ask when someone recommends something is say, well, what's what what's the evidence for that? Yeah. Um, you know, ideally, a randomized control trial, but not always. We can talk about other, other forms of evidence, too. Um, and if there is no evidence uh, really to guide something, you're doing it because, say, one of your professors did it while you were a trainee um, and now you've become attached to it and so on. Uh, but you're not sure if it works. Well, that's the perfect opportunity to do science. Um, and, uh, you know, the biggest failure of um, you know the pandemic uh, was not doing more public health research uh, in particular, and uh, you know I think I think that every time every time you want to do something or every time other people want to do something, you should be able to ask, well, what's the evidence for that? And we should be able to have a dispassionate conversation uh, about the evidence. Um, otherwise, we might end up doing things that turn out in the long term to be wrong. Yeah, that's really well put. You know, there was all these stories about like when does the pandemic end? And um, I know you had some great thoughts that it's not a medical ending. It's like a sociologic ending. But I have one thought that came to me since we spoke, which is when is the pandemic really over? And it's going to be really over the first time I go to the university and a grand rounds, there's an honest discussion. There's been zero to date. They won't let anyone go give, they, they won't let anyone talk about why we shouldn't have masked or shouldn't lock down. I mean, it's not an explicit taboo. It's just not done um, because they don't want to hurt the feelings of the people on the other side of the issue. Uh, but it'll really be over when I'm allowed to give my grand rounds called COVID-19, what really happened, and rip everyone a new asshole, which I'm going to do on schools, on masking, on Paxlovid, on vaccine policy, on the subgroups that were harmed. When you can say all that in grand rounds and not just a podcast, that's when, for me, it will be over. Um, what are your thoughts? When is it going to be over for you? Well, I think you're, I think you're going to be waiting a long time for that, unfortunately. <laughs> even, uh, I think five years, maybe. I think five years. Yeah, because I mean, what, and what that what that tells you is that the real pandemic is is a pandemic of kind of censorship and yeah. um, lack of acceptance of dissent, and and that we want to be able to welcome dissent back into democratic society. But there's there's wider problems with that. Um, for me, the key question. Uh, really for the next time is when should the pandemic emergency be over? When should emergency power, if, if emergency powers are invoked, when should they be ceased? Um, and, you know, I think the United States finally just, just wound down their COVID emergency three years in or three more, more than three years in now. And I think the answer is for me, once high risk individuals have had access, the ability to access a vaccine, uh, then the emergency is over. And that's when looking back on COVID, that's when we should have declared the emergency over um, this time, as that would have been in kind of early to mid 2021. And next time it might be sooner. 
Um, but the emergency shouldn't go on, shouldn't go on for too long because we should be reluctant to set aside normal society for too long because the harms are too great. It's so funny you said that. I, I feel like I just tweeted that today because I was saying the emergency should have been over when every high risk individual was offered the vaccine. Then you've done your due diligence is done. Um, here's one, one other perverse thought. I think that there's a generation of us that will remember these lessons. That's why in the next 10 years, I think it's unlikely that a new virus will play out this way, but eventually we'll be dead. And then a hundred years from now, they're going to rhyme again. I think maybe even harder, like every, as society advances, the abilities of the technology to control people are stronger. Like in 1918, they can't track you on your cell phone by 2110, when there's the real next, you know, whatever the next pandemic, they'll, they'll be able to lock your doors remotely. I don't know. They'll be able to really, really destroy, cut your communication signals. Like they'll have total control over you. Um, so we'll die and then they're going to bungle it again. Thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, I think one, one problem, one problem with, um, with COVID is not only that people couldn't remember a previous bad pandemic, but also many of the relevant people in high income countries couldn't even remember war or any kind of exceptional episode. You know, they've forgotten these kind of exceptional periods of history. And so they were willing to have all these kind of emergency measures put in uh, without questioning them too much. Um, you know, in my family, I, you know, I would talk about World War II with my grandfather and you know, I thought about I thought about that a lot. Um, but, you know, like you say, it's going to partly depend on what the overall trends in society are towards authoritarianism or towards kind of freedom, towards technological control or not. Um, but some things, some things are permanent, you know, in, in humanity. And one of them is, um, you know, that famous idea that all that is necessary for bad things to happen is for good people to do nothing. Right. right? And if there aren't enough people standing up um, against uh, unreasonable measures being put in place, uh, then it will happen again. Well, I just saw um, Bill Gates recommended uh, Devi Schreeder's new book on how to handle the next pandemic. Or so. so I was like, oh, God, <laughs> we've learned nothing. We've learned nothing. Okay. But Zeb, um, I guess I'll say any any issues we didn't talk about that we should have mentioned? I thought it was a great discussion as always. No, yeah, I, I think uh, I, th I think that's it. I mean, I, I think... Um, one other thing we need to be mindful of is just uh, how, lang how language is used. Uh, you know, um, we've talked about the Iraq war. They came up with this term weapons of mass destruction and they right. used it to justify all kinds of crazy stuff. At the start of the pandemic, people said uh, the precautionary principle and they used that as kind of, no, it wasn't a principle. It was just like carte blanche to do whatever you want. Right. Um, so we shouldn't be sucked in. Uh, you know, George Orwell has, the, has this famous essay about, about language. Um, and and it, if people want to do something that's well justified, they should be able to give us a simple, plain language justification. Um, and whenever uh, you know, you think you're being fooled, uh, you think you think people aren't aren't you know being 100 percent truthful about how good something is, you're probably wrong. That's great. That's great, Zeb. It's a pleasure. We're going to stop now, and then I'm going to see if I can find a topic that I disagree with you about because. I really agree with everything you've always said about the pandemic. That's really, I think, so similarly. So thank you for doing this and explaining it so wonderfully to everyone. Thanks for coming. Yeah, no worries.